where we're at is still in our kind of review of the JavaScript language, which I am hoping to complete today. Although there will be still some aspects of the syntax of JavaScript that I won't cover in these set of slides, but we'll just introduce them as we need them uh, when we uh, work our way through React and Node. So I want to look at these slides here uh, today. Last day, it was all about uh, state and data, and the central construct was this thing called an object. Uh, today, we want to talk about behavior or logic, and quite neatly, there is uh, one construct as well that dominates how we encapsulate and compose logic, and it is the function construct. As I mentioned to you last week, JavaScript does have classes as well. Class, class would also be categorized as a method of encapsulating logic, but classes in JavaScript have to be transpiled back to functions because classes are not native to the language and therefore they're not really understood by the JavaScript runtime engine. So it's all about functions. And I, I don't use classes at all in my part of the code. I'm not certain whether Frank uses them. He, he used them too, but uh, last year, I think he may have introduced classes. Now he may well revert back to plain old functions again this year. I didn't check with him actually, but classes in JavaScript look exactly the same. Well, almost exactly the same as classes in Java. So there shouldn't be any kind of mind shift required on your part to understand classes in JavaScript. However, it's all about functions for me. And what I'm seeing here is that uh, functions uh, from the outset were part of the language and are still part of the language. And uh, in ES5, remember ES5, ECMAScript 5 is what I kind of uh, refer to as old JavaScript. Um, that gave us two ways of declaring functions, function declarations and function expressions. We'll see how what the syntax of those are in a moment. There was always so this odd thing in JavaScript from the outset called hoisting. Uh, it, it's really gone from the language now, but the idea was that if you can imagine you've got a JavaScript file and you've got a function declared somewhere down in the middle of the file, but you're actually invoking the function prior to its declaration that was actually possible in that in javascript and it's still possible and the reason it worked is because at runtime what happened was all functions no matter where they were declared in the file were kind of hoisted to the top of memory and therefore you could invoke it um, in your in your file you're invoking it before its declaration but at runtime the declaration actually occurs before the invocation. Not sure what uh, the thinking was behind it, but it's essentially gone from the language now. ES6 then, which came in in 2015 and beyond, that introduced arrow functions. Now, arrow functions were really a cleaner syntax for function expressions. There was another aspect to arrow functions as well, which doesn't impact on us, but uh, I leave it aside for now. I command it if we need to. But for as far as we're concerned, it's just a cleaner syntax for uh, defining a function. There's also a shorthand version of these arrow functions. And as a beginner, you would probably use the longhand version. Uh, as you get more comfortable, you could start using the shorthand version. And you see us using the shorthand version every now and again. Or maybe more than every now and again in our code. It's it's a little bit off-putting initially, uh, but I'll show you an example of it anyway. From day one, JavaScript always had the notion of an anonymous function. An anonymous function is a function with no name, which sounds odd initially. How could you invoke a function if it doesn't have a name? But it turns out that these anonymous functions are something that we use a lot, and you will see me and Frank using them a lot. Uh, and there is one, I suppose, use case for them, but that use case arises an awful lot in our code. 
Now, as last week, I'm going to demonstrate these things uh, with some sample code. So again, there is an archive that you can download and unzip. It's you get it, the archive from the associated lab with this set of slides. And so if I import that into my VS code, And it's the same process as last week, which is we start up our live server. Open up our developer tools. And all of this stuff on the right now is coming from a Java script file. If we look at my index.html, and I've got a number of script tags, and the only one that's enabled is this one here, and it's referring to this file here. And really all I'm doing is uh, illustrating some of the basics of JavaScript functions. So again, I've got a me object, Similar to last week, I've got a her object. The idea here now is that the me and the her objects are kind of notionally representing people. I've got a here object, which is representing a place. So there, that's the kind of data that I'm going to be using in the rest of the file. So first of all, I'm showing you here uh, how we code function declarations. Now, I am kind of conscious from the interactions that I've had with you in the labs last week that this stuff is probably too simplistic for you, but I'm just want to cover the same ground so that everybody's on the same uh, starting point. This is a function declaration, so I'm a keyword function, the name I want to give the function, my parameters to the function, and then the body of the function is wrapped in curly braces. I talked last week about uh, the scope of variables, and I said that variables scope scoping is block scoped so that would mean here for example that any variable that i declare inside this block because i've got curly braces there and in, uh, in, uh, in closing my block any variables declared inside that block are only visible inside that block now uh, the me and the her and the here uh, variables are declared outside all functions so they're visible throughout this file anyway uh, but I am passing in, oh yeah, sorry. So the the uh, based on the name of the function, it looks like the purpose of this function is to determine whether the object that's passed into it is a person or not. And I'm just doing it by means of this Boolean expression here. Remember the in operator, the in operator checks to see whether the thing on the left is a property of the thing on the right. So, uh, but for now, in terms of functions, I would say that this function here uh, is, is declared using function declaration syntax. Function expressions are a second way of declaring a function. And in this case, we assign a function to a variable. Like we don't give the function a name in here at all. So the name of this function that I'm declaring here its name is whatever name I give the variable. The nice thing about function expressions is if you can assign a function to a variable and we know we can pass variables around the place, that means we can pass logic around the place. We can pass logic to as a parameter into a function. Uh, and that was quite, that's a very powerful uh, feature of any language. Of course, you can do the same now with Java and Lambdas lambdas were are essentially based on the same idea as these function expressions in javascript uh, and just in terms of what this function does uh, based on the in name anyway it seems like it's uh validate person is that the same thing uh validate person validate person that looks like oh sorry sorry big, bigger pun no uh, add middle name. What am I doing? Uh, add middle name. The idea of this function I had was that you pass it in a person object and you pass it in a string. 
uh, where the string represents a middle name for the person, and you add the middle name to the object that's passed into it. If the person already has a middle name, so if I scroll up, you can see there that the me object doesn't have a middle name, as in this person doesn't have a middle name, whereas the her object does have a middle name. So if I want to add a middle name to her, then it's just going to uh, extend the person's middle name, give them a double middle name if you like. But in terms of functions anyway, this is what we call a function expression. Um, just in passing, that's how you get a function to throw an exception. Uh, so it looks like I'm first of all checking, which would make sense. I'm first of all checking that the, the object that was passed in to me is actually a person. And I'm using the function I declared a little bit earlier to help me with that. So if that function returns a zero, then throw my exception. Uh, otherwise here, all I'm doing is checking to see, does the person already have a middle name? Now, the way I'm doing it here is really kind of old style. Uh, but if we just take it as it is, I'm going if person.name.middle equals undefined. Remember we said last week that if you try and access a property, if you try and access a non-existent property of an object, then that expression evaluates to undefined. And so this expression here, person.name.middle, that would evaluate to undefined if the person currently doesn't have a middle name. For example, the me object uh, at the top. Uh, the triple equals, um, JavaScript has a double equals and a triple equals. You should never use the double equals anymore. Double equals is ES5. Triple equals was introduced in ES6. The technical difference between a double equals and a triple equals is that the triple equals checks that the things it's comparing are of the same type, if you like, whereas the double equals doesn't bother doing that. Uh, and it's always safer to make sure that the things you're comparing are of the same type. It wouldn't be a good uh, to, let's say, compare, check to see if a string is equal to a number. Uh, that You get odd results from JavaScript as a result of that. There are a number of odd aspects to the JavaScript language, which over the years we've, uh, the community has tried to remove from the language. One thing is the comparison operator, the double equals uh, has now been replaced or was in, uh, has been replaced, I guess, yeah. It's still there, I suppose, but you shouldn't use it. Uh, the, the correct thing to do is to use the triple equals. But other than that, all we're just doing here is a comparison. The, uh, so so checking to see that it's equal to undefined, that's fine. That That is a valid way of checking to see whether middle, the person has a middle name or not. But I talked about the in operator T. And so I probably should have written this in a more modern style and the more modern form of it is, I know I'm kind of reverting back to something we did last week now, but if I put middle, it's middle, in person.name and then get rid of all of this stuff. That's essentially uh, the same. But, you know, this, this is a better way of doing it. I, th I think I'm checking if it's not. So if I put a not in front of that, so again, that's that's saying the same thing. If person.name does not include a property called middle, then give them a middle name. Uh, to be honest, you'll find me using the other way that I've coded this more so in, in my files. That's just because <laughs> I've been programming JavaScript for a couple of years now, so I'm still got some old habits. Moving on anyway. Otherwise, we just kind of concatenate the middle name that was passed down to the person to the person's current middle name. Now, because and here I'm just showing you examples of invoking it. I'm not checking the browser or uh, what's happening in the browser now. You can do that in your own time, really. But for example, the console that logs that are happening uh, in 
that part of the file. So I added a middle name to myself and I extended uh, Yvonne's middle name to Yvonne Jane because I called at middle name with her and I, sorry, what did I do? Oh yeah, I added Jane to her middle name. The reason, of course, that I'm wrapping uh, all of this code in a try-catch block here, or does anybody want to suggest to me why am I wrapping this code here in a try-catch block? Whereas I didn't use a try-catch block up here at all when I was invoking the validate person uh, function. Why am I using a try catch block here, I wonder? Anybody want to volunteer an answer? No. It's because uh, add middle name potentially uh, could throw an error. And then you know it could throw this. So whenever you've got a function that has the potential to throw an exception, then you've got to wrap its invocation in a try catch block. That's the exact same as in Java. That's why I just asked for uh, a volunteered answer because you've seen this kind of try catch stuff before. And of course, down here, look what I'm doing. I'm calling. Um, I am. What am I doing? Sorry. Oh yeah. If I do, if I do this, I've disabled it, but. If I enable that line where I'm calling add middle name and I'm passing it the here object, where here is not a person, it's actually a place, then based on my implementation of add middle name, then it's going to throw that exception. And I'm just try catching it and I'm re throwing it. So if I leave this line enabled, it's just going to throw the exception here. And so if I save it, um, there is my exception thrown there on the right. Moving on, uh, next, okay, our functions. Uh, do we need to go back to the slides? All right, so we, we looked at function declarations. We've looked at an example of function expressions hoisting we don't really care about anymore. Uh, arrow functions, what do they look like? So here is where we have an arrow function. Okay, uh, and so where it gets name from is this symbol here is notionally similar to uh, looks like an arrow anyway. That's where the name comes from. And what's to the left of the arrow are the parameters of the function. And what's to the right of the arrow uh, enclosed in curly braces is the body of the function. So what does this uh, function do? But it's, it is a function though. It's just uh, like, all, like the two earlier functions that we've looked at. This function based on the name anyway, looks again like it takes a person object determines whether they're male or female and just returns a string with a salutation. So it's Mr. for male and uh, Miss for female, something like that. So that's all it does. Again, sensibly, I think I'm checking to make sure that the person, that the, the object passed into me uh, has the characteristics of a person and determine their name. This is just the... Um, this here is the uh, ternary operator. Uh, it's something you would, you would have seen potentially in other languages, the way you interpret this line of code here, sorry, this line of code here is, it evaluates the expression before the question mark to see if it's true or false. And you can see what I'm doing is I'm checking to see if the gender is equal to M, the gender property is equal to M. If that's true then, I'm assigning what follows the question mark, but before the colon, I'm assigning that to title. Otherwise, I'm assigning this to title. 
So again, that's called the, this is called the ternary operator. It's really a shorthand version of if else. And I'm illustrating it here and I'm passing it in me. So I expect what I get back is, I need to save that file, sorry. So I got back, Mr. Dermot O'Connor. Uh, back to here. Um, I'm also saying here that there is a shorthand version of the arrow function, which I elaborate on in the next slide. Um, uh, some of the syntax associated with the arrow function can be dropped optionally under certain circumstances. And I'm uh, explaining, sorry, I'm explaining here what parts of the syntax can be dropped but maybe just to illustrate it rather than talk through it. I would advise that you don't use the shorthand version initially because you need to be comfortable with the notion of arrow functions. And once you practice these arrow functions enough, then you probably get into the swing of using them and using the shorthand version of them when it's possible to do that. So here I've got a... Uh, an arrow function as well. But the first thing you'll notice is that I haven't put the curly braces around the body. You know, up here, the body is begins with a curly brace and the closing curly brace down here. Whereas, whereas there's no curly brace is going on here. And so you can drop the curly braces if the body of the arrow function consists of one statement. And that is the case in this uh, example. That's, that single statement is the entire body of this arrow function. So we can drop the curly braces uh, under those circumstances. Number two, we don't have to use the return keyword if the single statement that comprises the body of the arrow function is the return value of that arrow function. And I do want this function, but you can kind of determine hopefully from the name I've given it. Um, the purpose of this function is to check whether a person has a middle name or not. So presumably that's going to return a Boolean, true or false. And what I'm doing here is, oh dear, what I'm doing here is again checking is it a person? And if it is, then and that with this expression here, does the person have a middle name? So if those two are true, then return a true, otherwise return false. But it's returning a Boolean anyway. And that is the return type, if you like. Uh, I don't have to use the return keyword at all. Whereas up here, I did use the return keyword. The third part of the syntax that you can remove is if the parameter, if there's only one parameter, you can actually remove the parentheses. So I should have actually, strictly speaking, did that. And so that is a complete example now of a shorthand version of the arrow function. And you can mix and match it. You know, you could say, I don't really like the way that looks. I'm going to put in my parentheses, or my curly braces, sorry. And if you do, then you have to use the return keyword. Okay, I can still leave the parentheses out here, leave them out because that looks okay. So again, you just get used to this after a while, I hope. So that's the shorthand version of the arrow function. What's next? Um, right, let's move on. All I'm showing you in this screenshot is, you know, if you're familiar with pre-ES6 JavaScript and you're trying to wrap your head around some of the modern parts of JavaScript, there is this website called babbelgs.io. 
you might remember Babel is a set of tools that we can use for converting modern JavaScript back into old JavaScript, or maybe I should strictly speak, he's saying we're converting ES6 JavaScript back to ES5 JavaScript. So there are, there are uh, Babel provides command line tools that we can use, but there's also this kind of convenience website that you can use. And that's what I'm showing you is a screenshot from here. And what you can do on this convenience web shot, um, convenience website is you can paste modern JavaScript in on the left and it will generate the ES5 equivalent of that on the right. So I, I've kind of done that in this screenshot. Here's my uh, salute arrow function. And here's the ES5 equivalent of it. So it's essentially just using function expressions as a, an equivalent of my arrow function. And note it's using the var keyword instead of the uh, instead of the const keyword. Const was introduced in ES6. Here's another example where I've got an arrow function with lots of the shorthand syntax. And here's the equivalent in ES5. Again, it's just using a function expression. You may not ever need to use this web, this uh, convenience website, but it's there anyway. Some other function characteristics. There is this notion of constructor functions. I'm not going to spend uh, any time on them because we don't need to use them. But as their name kind of suggests, we know what a constructor is from other programming languages that we've studied. Constructor is something that creates an instance of a type. Well, that's what constructor functions serve in JavaScript, and they've been there from the outset. So I could have actually used a constructor function for creating the me and her objects there. It would have been better programming if I had done it that way. Now, any more than that, I'm not going to say about constructor functions. You can read up on them if you like yourself, but you never need to use them directly. If you were implementing classes in JavaScript, uh, and you had a constructor method in your class, which you nearly always need, that constructor method in a JavaScript class is actually converted into a constructor function in ES5 JavaScript, by the way. Just some other things that I'm mentioning here, uh, this notion of side effects, this is, a, this is a generic programming idea. If you've got a, uh, and if we just relate it to JavaScript, if you've got a JavaScript function that changes some data that isn't declared within the function. So if, for example, the me object was declared outside of any function that I had there. But if I have a function that actually changed the me object, then we would say that that function causes a side effect. It changes some data outside of its environment, if you like, that's the way I'm phrasing it here. So the add middle name function, for example, that causes a side effect because it actually changed the object by adding a middle name property to it or extending it if it already existed. Whereas the salute function that I did showed you there a moment ago, that did not have any side effects. It didn't change anything outside of its space. Now, in the context of side effects, um, if if a if a function actually performs I/O, then that's actually classified as a side effect. So again, this is just a programming idea that you may have heard of before, um, and I'm just mentioning it here because it's 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 uh, convenient to use it. A pure function is kind of is a, essentially a function that does not cause any side effects. And ideally, we'd like to write as much functions as we can that are pure, because it's always easier to debug code if you've got uh, pure functions, or as many pure functions as possible in it, or as many of your functions should be pure rather than ones that cause side effects. There is a whole area of programming called functional programming. My box drawing isn't great now, but um, an area of programming called functional programming. And in fact, you will be studying a module called functional programming next year. And it's really, it's really centered around this idea of writing, writing code that is pure in the sense that I've explained it here. 
and it's minimal in terms of side effects in terms of how I've explained it here. So these these terms are generic programming kind of ideas. That's just uh, in passing really this slide doesn't really affect, it's not gonna affect us in our, what we are studying on this module, but I thought it was uh, useful just to introduce them. Sticking with the whole area of functions, uh, we often talk about the notion of higher order functions. And in English, a higher order function is a function that takes another function as a parameter. That, that function parameter we refer to as a callback. And so we have this notion of the your, your, um, your main function, if I call it that, and you have the callback function where the callback is passed into the main function. And presumably the reason you, you pass the callback into the main function is because it's going to invoke it at some stage within its body. And this idea of higher order functions uh, is something that you will see an awful lot of in this module. And you see an awful lot of it in JavaScript in general. And you just need to get comfortable with uh, seeing that kind of code. So generically, I'm saying this is what it looks like here. It doesn't matter whether we use function declarations or function expressions or arrow functions. I'm just using function declaration here to illustrate the general syntax. So I'm declaring a function which I've called some HOF. It can have ordinary parameters, but one of the parameters is actually going to be a callback. It's going to be a function. And I'm not showing you the body of, I'm not showing you the body of this, but as I said, somewhere inside in the body, it's just going to invoke this thing uh, to, to carry out some behavior for it. Now, it, uh, we usually code this callback as an anonymous function, which is something I haven't talked about so far. Okay, uh, so we'll see that. Now, by way of example, I am going to talk about higher order functions in the context of the array data type, because it has a whole series of methods. Remember I said the last day that I can interchange the word method and function, they are really interchangeable. Uh, but strictly speaking, I need to, I, we should probably refer to these things as methods rather than functions, but a method is just a function that's attached to a particular data type. So these methods all, uh, expect a callback as one of their parameters. And the simplest one to look at is this one, the for each. So here I've got a simple array. And what the for each does, well, sorry, the, the for each method expects a callback, which is just a function, as an argument. And that's the only argument. And I've decided to code my callback using the arrow function syntax. I could have used function declaration, but uh, today you will see the arrow representation more, more, more often than function declaration. So if I just try and break that up, all of this Okay, so that, that parenthesis there is closing this parenthesis up here. So it looks like that this thing here is a parameter to this method. Uh, and the way the for each uses this parameter, this callback is, it invokes the callback once for each element in the array. So the first time, uh, the first time it invokes this callback, it's going to invoke it on the part of the two. The next time it invokes it on, be on behalf of the three and so on. The callback uh, has to be coded such that it takes a maximum of three parameters. The first parameter is going to be bound to the current value of the array that's being processed. So n is going to be equal to two the first time this callback executes. Second time, the second time this callback executes, it's going to be equal to, and it's going to be equal to three, and so on. Index is going to be set to the index position of the element in the array, and array is going to point to the entire array. I'm not doing anything interesting in the callback. I'm just doing a console.log. So that console.log there generates 
this stuff here. Now, as it turns out, um, one another characteristic of JavaScript is this notion of variable argument links. And if I, for example, take out this part of just the string, which means I'm not using this argument at all, then I can just get rid of it. And everything would still work okay, provided I have no syntax errors. So if I save that, you know, it still works fine. Uh, this this variable argument variable arguments idea is just a, is a generic JavaScript characteristic. The idea is if you've got a function that expects a number of arguments but on some circumstances, you don't need to pass all of the arguments to it, then you can just leave them out when you're invoking it. You can leave out the arguments that aren't needed. They have to be the arguments at the back end of its argument list though. You couldn't, for example, do something like this. You couldn't say, oh, I'm not using, I'm not using index, so I'll just take that out. Uh, that's not gonna work because now, array is actually going to be the name associated with the index value uh, within the body of this arrow function. Just going to pause for a second. Uh, I don't pause that often, unfortunately, but uh, if there are any questions. So the overarching point is for each is an example of a higher order function stroke method because for each takes a callback, it takes a function as an argument. This is my callback. The callback is uh, is main is is more often than not, it's coded as an anonymous function, which I haven't really um, what's an anonymous function. An anonymous function is a function with no name. And indeed, this function doesn't have a name, a name. Uh, the fact that I encoded it as an arrow function is just coincidental. I could just as well have encoded, uh, encoded it as a uh, function declaration, as in I could go function, get rid of the arrow, and everything should still work okay. Fingers crossed. Yeah, still works fine. So uh, for each is one example of a higher order function. Another method of array is the filter method. And yeah, I can skip over that. Okay, before I talk about filter, just going to go off on a tangent for a second. Uh, there is this web API called the uh, random user uh, API, which you can see here. And if you call this API, what it will do is it will randomly generate user profiles. And by user profile, I mean an object that contains person properties. So name, address, age, date of birth, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a nice, convenient, useful web API that we can use, that anybody can use uh, if they're essentially, as we are kind of messing around in JavaScript. So that's the API, the random user web API. We're gonna be using that in the rest of this set of slides. This is how you communicate with the web API, just an ordinary HTTP request. You can see at the end here, uh, it takes a query string and the way you interpret what is being requested here from the random user API is I'm asking it to generate 10 uh, randomly generated user profiles. So if I actually just click, I click that, it's not going to allow me, uh, how am I gonna do it? I'll do it like this, sorry. I will do it like this. 
thought I could just click on it, but it doesn't look like I can. So if I go to my browser, and this is just a bunch of, this is a JSON response that it returns back to me. And if I just grab all of that, and use a website that converts JSON into a format that that's readable, which I think I Googled earlier on. This one here, paste it in, format that for me, please. And this is what it returns back. So it returns back a an object, which only has one property called results. And the results property is assigned an array of objects where each object in the array is a user profile. Okay, that's the random user web API. Now, where I'm going to use it in my demos is as follows. This is kind of a graphical representation of what's going to be going on in the sample code that we're going to be looking at. I have my live server web server, and that's going to serve the index.html. And the index.html is going to have a reference to a JavaScript script. So it's going to pull down some JavaScript code as well. My JavaScript code is going to communicate with the random user web API to get some data. And when that data comes back, I want to process that data. And in my case, I'm going to be processing it with uh, one of these higher order functions, maybe filter or map or reduce. And it's going to just be outputting to the, it's going to be outputting just to the browser's console. I'm not going to be outputting anything to the UI as such, because that's unnecessarily complicated. So that's the, the architecture, if you like, of the little samples that we're going to be looking at. I'm going to skip over that. So if we look at the base uh, illustration of using this web API. So we're comfortable. There, I suppose the question arises. The question arises: How do we? How do we make this communication here? How do we program this in JavaScript? And that's what I want to illustrate first in uh, in this JavaScript file. So these look, looks like my JavaScript file is just displaying the names of the 10 randomly generated user profiles that I asked the random user API for. So let's look at the actual code that produced that for me. So how do we talk to a remote server essentially from JavaScript code that's running inside a browser. There is this function that's built into browsers called the fetch function, and you give it a URL, and it sends a HTTP GET request to that URL. You can also get it to send POST and other HTTP requests. Now, whatever that returns back to me, and it's going to return it sometime in the future, it's going to be asynchronous because we're communicating across a network. Uh, it returns back something to me, and I'm being ex uh, intentionally vague because we don't care about the structure of the thing that it sends back to us. But whatever it returns back, I then want to call. Wait, what? We're university. Sorry, somebody needs to mute their microphone there, lads, please. 
Uh, I want to call a method called then on that. And then takes an, R, an anonymous function as an argument. And essentially what this anonymous function does is uh, it takes the response that comes back from the web API and it converts it from JSON. And we know that the response that comes back is going to be in JSON format. It converts it from JSON to JavaScript. It strips out the headers and it just gives us the body of the response that comes back. And it returns back that to uh, whoever wants to use it. Now, what it returns back, I'm using, and I'm invoking another instance of then on that. And this second instance of then also takes an anonymous function or a callback. The callback is past the body of the response that came back from the web API. And then I can do whatever I want to with that body. And you can see what I'm doing here is I'm indexing into the results part of the body. And I showed you there a moment ago that in the structure of the response that comes back from the web API does have a property called results. So I'm grabbing the results part of the body and I'm assigning it to local variable called profiles. So profiles now is going to be my array. And then I'm just calling for each on that. Uh, iterating through the array, and I'm picking out particular parts of each object. Of course, now, before I could write this code at all, I would have to study the structure of the data that comes back. In other words, I would have to, you know, look at this stuff here, make sure I understand the structure. Now, I think that's okay. The only thing that's probably throwing you from a pure code point of view is kind of stuff that's going on here, this then method and another invocation of then. An alternative way of me coding this would have been to code it like this. Okay, so I'm just calling a function here uh, and it returns something to me. And then I call the then method on this thing. This response object is part of the fetch API itself. I would have to study the fetch API, which I don't really want, we don't really need to get into. Um, the first invocation of the then on the thing that was returned by fetch, you pass it, you pass that then method, a callback function. And as far as we're concerned, really, uh, this is kind of boilerplate. You should just regard this as boilerplate. Uh, to explain what's going on in the background is, it's possible that what is being returned by fetch is actually fragmented. We know if we send large volumes of data across a network, it's possible that the data is going to be fragmented as it travels through the network. And then when it arrives at its eventual destination, which in our case is the browser, that uh, fragmented data needs to be reassembled. That is essentially what is going on uh, here. It doesn't look like it, but that is what's going on. In other words, that's what the JSON method does. It reassembles the data, number one. And number two, it converts the JSON data that comes back into ordinary JavaScript objects. And number three, it kind of strips away all the headers in the HTTP response that comes back. And it just uh, isolates the body part of the HTTP response. And it returns that reassembled body part of the response. It returns that back uh, wrapped with some other stuff returns it to this thing here. Now, in order for me to get at the actual body, I have to call the then method on that body, on that structure as well, pass it a callback. And this second instance of then will call this callback. 
and what it will pass to it is the actual body of the response in uh, which will be a JavaScript object structure of some sort. And now eventually I have what I want. I actually have the actual data and I can process my data. In this case, this is the form of the processing. So really what I would uh, suggest is you should treat, number one, you should write it like this and not the way that I showed you there a minute ago. Number two, just treat it as boilerplate. The only thing that's gonna change uh, from one usage of this fetch over another is it's gonna be a different URL. This part here is gonna be boilerplate. It's, it's not gonna change. This part here is not going to change. And this is going to change though, because the structure of the response that comes back from a different web API is obviously going to be different from the random user web API. And there isn't always going to be a property called results. That will again vary from API to API. So uh, that's the 101 example of how you communicate with a web API from JavaScript code that's running inside the browser. Now, as usual, I kind of talked too much and I didn't get as far as I wanted to get. To go back to the whole area of higher order functions, I want to next, although not now, look at the filter higher order function. And again, we will use and if I go back to this here, what's going to happen now in my JavaScript code is I'm going to talk to the web API, get 10 randomly generated user profiles, and then filter those profiles. Maybe if I just want to display uh, the male people in the set of profiles, or I just want to display the people whose age is less than 30, okay? I could write that code using some sort of using the for each and having an if statement and all that kind of stuff. That would work fine. But the filter function uh, is a better approach to solving that little problem than using the for each and an if statement. Uh, could I just look at the filter? I wonder. <laughs> Let me just. Uh, launch it anyway for you. Here's the filter code, exact same structurally as before. I use my fetch to talk to my random user API, ask it for 10 profiles, purpose of this line, as I try to explain, is reassemble the fragmented response that comes back if it is fragmented, uh, reassemble it, and strip out all the headers and just give me the body of the response. Eventually, I have the body of the response here. I attach that to a local uh, variable called profiles. And for example, if I want to, let's say my objective here is as I said, find the female profiles. Well, I could have implemented it like this, right? I could have a bog standard for loop with an if statement. That's going to work fine, but that's very old fashioned and it's not very JavaScript like, like in its approach. Instead, I can call the filter method, which is a higher order method function. And indeed, I am passing it just like the for each. The filter takes one argument, which is a callback. Here is my callback. And the way it works is it passes in the current entry in the array that's being processed and the index position of that if you need it. And you can see what I'm doing here is I'm checking to see in the return statement, I feel now that I'm just rushing to this and I don't want to do that. In the return statement, I'm just checking to see, is this person a female? or is their gender property set to female? Uh, what I should have said as well about filter is, 
filter takes an array, that's an array, and it generates a new array. The new array will contain each entry in the source array for which the callback returns a Boolean true. My callback returns a Boolean true if this condition is true. That must mean that this guy is going to be an array that just contains user profiles for female uh, entries. Another example here is I want to pick out everybody whose age is less than uh, 40. I'm using the filter again, but my condition in this case is this condition here. And I happen to be using the shorthand version of the arrow function. Uh, sorry, it's it's uh, males under 40. So I check to see is the gender male and is the age less than 40. But again, the callback returns a Boolean true or false. And for every true that it returns, it puts the corresponding entry from my source array, puts a copy of it, if you like, into the output array. Right. Um, I won't try and hang on any longer. We need to finish these um, these set of slides the next day, which is Wednesday. Okay. Did I turn on my camera? Sorry. Right, that's it, folks. Uh, sorry for dragging it on a little bit, but uh, I'll talk to you again on Wednesday. Bye for now.